Welcome back to the channel. We are continuing our Radical Self-Care for Black Women series. My name is Colette, and I created this channel as a safe space with you in mind. Today, I have a very special guest. She is going to talk about self-care and creatives. Fani, if he has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in theaters from UCLA with an emphasis on musical theater. She just graduated this year. She's a multi-talented native. She sings, she acts, she directs, she writes, and she dances. She aspires to pursue a PhD in psychology or sociology. Right now she's taking a post-graduation gap year. She's worked on projects such as Diverse as executive director. Diverse is UCLA's first Black a cappella group since the 50s. She was a staff writer for a newspaper called The No Youth Media. And she is my baby. So I want you to welcome Ifani. Is that okay? You want me to use your nickname or you want me to call you Ifani? Ifani's fine. Okay, I'll be calling her by her name that the mama calls her, which is Ifani. Others know her as Ify. So during my Radical Self-Care for Black Women series, I'm approaching self-care as intentional activities or rituals that support overall well-being. What does self-care mean to you? You know, it's interesting because one of the first things that comes to mind with self-care is I think about meditation, right? Not necessarily because I meditate, not as often as I should, but I think about it because I think the way that people think about the two are similar. So a lot of the times with meditation, it's like people feel like you have to clear your mind or you have to create a specific structure or image in your head, as opposed to most people who actually meditate regularly, they're like, meditation is whatever you make it. And meditation is whatever feeds and nourishes you. So I feel the same way about self-care. It could be some of the typical things you're used to seeing, like retail therapy and spas, treatments and whatnot. But it could be something as simple as actually brushing your teeth or brushing whatever else you need to brush and scrub and just being careful with yourself and allowing yourself to show up at the best way possible at that very moment on that day during that week whatever wow yeah that is so interesting that you say that because you are so right and one of the things i do emphasize to viewers is i explain is that there is no right or wrong way to self-care because we're all different we do it differently so I really appreciate your answer. And you're right. Depending on what's going on in your life, something as simple as brushing your teeth could be self-care. And some people may argue and say, oh, that's just basic hygiene. But depending on what a person is going through or dealing with that day, maybe that's the best that they can do for themselves to care for themselves that day. So in this series, I highlight five care areas including physical self-care, emotional self-care, mental self-care, and sometimes people call that intellectual self-care, spiritual self-care, and social self-care. Some people call it relational self-care. I want to talk a little bit today with you about social self-care, also known as relational self-care. As a multi-talented creative, you act, sing, dance, draw, and write. I'm thinking that creating and performing requires you to expend a lot of energy and give so much of yourself. So having said that, sometimes you have shared with me that your social meter is low. Please explain what you mean by that. And how do you know when your social meter is low? Mm -hmm. So for clarification, it's, it's not a term that I came up with, but it is a uh... It's kind of a way to describe, I guess, like how I'm feeling, if that makes sense. So if you're thinking about yourself as a phone, you are aware that there is only so long that you can do the things that you do on a regular. That's part of what we're talking about, about like sustainable activities, sustainable hobbies and habits and whatnot. That is kind of the same way I think about 
even the more recreational things I do, like talking to people, going out with people and so when my social meter is low, I'm essentially describing the fact that I have expended as much energy as I possibly can within whatever period of time. And I need some time to recharge. Relating to your second question, how I know my meter is low. So one of the things I do is I really try to just check in with myself. When we're talking about things like, especially mental health and like therapy in general, right? Like they always say the first step to recovery is acknowledging that you have a problem, is identifying the problem. I'll use problem very loosely in this situation because I, you know, it's not necessarily a problem, just a byproduct of, of, of me living and existing. Right. But applying that same logic to this context, I'm trying to, I like to make, be intentional about reliving everything that I just recently did. Maybe it was over the course of a week. I'm reliving the drinks I had with my friends, <laughs> activities I engaged in and, and all of that stuff and really taking it in. And part of why I do that is partially to savor it, like really, really absorb what happened and also identify the kind of drain that I'm experiencing. Okay. Because one thing is there is their social drain as it relates to like, you know, the natural byproduct of expending yourself in, in a variety of ways. And there's drain that comes from negative experiences. Right. Maybe I'm drained because I actually don't need to be around those people or I don't need to be in those situations or, or something bad happened or something like that. So if I can identify, at least in this, for the sake of this conversation, we're assuming I, I identify that it is normal drain and I feel very pleased with my experiences, then I, I kind of go from there. If I don't identify anything that I think went wrong, then that's how I know I'm just socially drained. Okay. Wow. I tell people all the time, I learn from everybody. And, and even though you're my child, and by the way, you all, she's my youngest. I had never heard that term until you used it with me. Probably was doing some of the same things, but I didn't have a word for it. And so sometimes when you have a word for something, it makes it make sense. I agree. Like having a term for it, I think is very helpful because I think that's one of those things that like, if you don't have a specific term to describe it specifically, then it's very easy to take it personally. So I know some of the instances with like other people in my life and I'm having to explain to them that I don't want to talk right now or I don't want to go out or I don't want to do these things despite everyone knowing me as the extroverted person. So it's like, if she doesn't want to go out, you, you must be the problem, which not really. <laughs> like it's right. thinking about it as a battery. Like we don't say that just because your car runs out of gas doesn't mean that it's a bad car. I mean, like unless... Right. There's some of you with a mileage, but we are aware that using your car is going to result in you using up gas. Yes. And so I feel like having language to describe things is very helpful for me in that way and helps me help other people understand me. You're right, because everybody knows that mother-daughter relationships can be pretty complicated and complex, multidimensional. Like, for example, the relationship you and I have you transition from being, even though I still call you my baby, you're not a baby according to society, but you're still my baby. And so that transition, it's pretty difficult, I think, on both parts, on the parent's part and the child's part, because now you have a child who is an adult and the parent is trying to figure out, okay, how do I navigate that? But what I'm getting to is when you started using that term social meter, like I would call and you say, my social meter is down. It did help me because it's so hard not to take things personally, especially when it has to do with relationships. But the fact that you use the term social meter, whenever you say that now, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Even though I didn't quite understand what social meter, I got that it, it was, you were, you were saying I needed some time. And that takes a lot of maturity and self-awareness to even be able to say that and acknowledge it and to articulate it. So I appreciate that. And for mothers and daughters who are watching this video, this may be helpful in those relationships too, which is why I have had her on the channel. Did you have anything mm -hmm. else you wanted to add? No, I, I think I'm good. Okay. 
So during this series, Radical Self-Care for Black Women, I emphasize how we cannot be helpful to others or in your case, perform as a creative optimally if we are depleted. So I always use the example of not being able to pour from an empty cistern or a pitcher. Mm -hmm. This in mind, when you find that your social meter is low, how do you practice self-care to recharge? So there's a few ways. One is doing things right by with myself. And so when I talk about this, I want to emphasize knowing the difference between hobbies and pastimes. And this means something different for every individual, but at least speaking for myself, I identify media consumption, whether I'm watching shows, listening to something, scrolling through socials and, and whatnot, those are what I would consider pastimes because they are passive activities okay. as opposed to hobbies like exercising, reading, um, and building and constructing and producing in some sort, especially in a creative capacity. Those are things that are more active. I consider those hobbies. The thing to note though, is that identifying the difference is important but both of them are things that I feel are important to have in your tool belt because you're going to need different things when you're in different states of being. Yeah. So sometimes when I'm socially drained, I am just as physically and mentally drained as I am socially. I don't want to do anything. Not a gosh darn thing. And so it's more beneficial to me to engage in one of my pastimes. Maybe I really just want to do something that doesn't require a lot of effort. So I, sh I can just slap in some music, a podcast or shows or whatever. But other times my social, my social depletion is very isolated. And it's not that I don't want to do anything. I just don't want to be around people. I just don't want to be bothered. And if that's the case, then that is an instance where I would cater more to some of my hobbies. And, and within hobbies, there's hobbies that are just kind of for funsies, you know, like maybe I'll go for a walk. I'm starting to do jitsu soon. So maybe I'll throw a man around or whatever, or I will engage in one of my hobbies, which are very clearly productive. Like I'm trying to engage in more creative writing. Like maybe I'll work on that or maybe I'll sing to myself, whether that's me just casually singing or right. like trying to learn a song, trying to form an arrangement or something like that. Those are some of the things that, that helps me. Another thing that comes to mind is, and I know you've always thought this was weird, but I personally think that talking to yourself is very helpful. And I will explain why. Some people like journaling, right? Some people like doing things, but I find it difficult to journal because I know that I'm never going to be able to write down everything I want to say. And so I'm going to be editing myself, even though I'm like, this is supposed to be for me, but I know that I don't want to expend the, the amount of energy it takes to write everything that just right. went through my in the past five minutes. So when I talk to myself, it helps me do essentially the same thing, but just while exerting less physical energy, while also externalizing my thoughts, because even while you're writing, you're still in your head. So it, by externalizing my thoughts, it's kind of a natural filter, actually. And even if I'm not talking to another person, I am explaining my thoughts to myself. So going back to what I was talking about, like processing all of the social things that I just finished doing, like maybe I'm really assessing like how, how that hangout went with my friends and I'm right. like going conversation I'm like no this she's knowing her she probably didn't really mean that so it's fine because she all she said it like this and we also said it. so things like that and I think part of that like being in conversation with yourself I've found that to be very helpful especially when it comes to building a relationship with yourself yeah yeah because hey I'm a pretty cool person like I'm okay. funny. like cracking myself up you accept like, your coolness now you know you get that from me Go well, ahead. Yeah, of course. But yeah, like I'm, I like making myself laugh. I like just, I even, especially knowing that I am constantly critiquing myself as well. And so I try to adjust those critiques to make them productive. So I really think that talking to oneself is more common than, than people would care to admit. I mean, since you guys have been gone, 
I've been talking to myself a lot. I even did it when I was here. I mean, and you guys know you used to hear me all the time laughing to myself. So I think that the main thing that journaling and talking to oneself has in common is getting those thoughts out of your head. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're verbalizing it, it's into the air. When you're writing it down, it's on a paper. And so I can see the similarities and I can see how either one could benefit. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out early, one of the things you said that, that really resonated with me is you are building a relationship with yourself, which is one of the things that I like to stress on the channel is the most important relationship that you'll have in this world is with yourself. And we're always working on that. I'm 56 and I'm still working on that because we change. You change who you are, what you expect, what you value. So I do appreciate the explanation. And I think that the viewers, you know, may be able to appreciate it too. Cause we, like I said, we talk to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, what are some practical things that creatives can do to practice self-care and recharge their social meter? Mm -hmm. So going back to the hobbies, I think one of the main things about creatives is that our, our creativity is often multifaceted. Yeah. One of the things I think about is uh, primary, secondary, and perhaps even tertiary skills. So I feel like for me, my primary skill is singing. I can do, I can sing upside down, all around and wherever. It doesn't really matter for me. And it's easy for me to do that in, in most contexts. And it doesn't really drain me a lot to do that. Okay. As opposed to drawing, drawing is something that I can do for some random reason. I mean, well, not, I guess it makes sense given from you and my father, but, but yeah, like I drawing is something that I can just do but I consider it a tertiary skill of mine. Like I don't have the urge to draw nearly as often as I have the urge to sing. Okay. And when I draw, it feels like I have expended, like, I mean, I, it feels like I've expended as much energy as I can on this drawing. And suddenly I can't draw until like however many months later when the urge comes back. Uh -huh. And the reason I bring that up is because I like to rotate them. So that I am constantly, because I feel like sometimes with creatives, one of the things we think about is even though realistically, most of us are multifaceted, we tend to get in our heads about it, especially with like imposter syndrome and whatnot. And so part of it, it's kind of something as simple as like sharpening all your knives, yeah, using all your, use it or lose it. Right. Like, yeah. Be in touch with as many facets of your creative creative identity as possible, but just do it one at a time. And so I feel like that's something practical. It's like, I, are, I know that I already worked a little bit on my story last time I was in, right. in this state of being. So now I'm gonna work on a song. So now I'm gonna work on an essay. So now I'm gonna work on a, a drawing. And that's another thing I wanna bring up. I feel like there's such a, there's such an unnecessary dichotomy that's made between creativity and intellectualism. That's true. And I remember the the first time I heard it, it was in a professional writing class that I took that my professor said that academic writing is creative writing, or at least it better be, otherwise that's plagiarism. That's right. So what if you are, you know, engaging in whatever nerd activities you are, like maybe you're an essayist like myself, or you like media analytics, whatever it is, be sure to acknowledge that as a creative venture as well. It also, like I said, it is intellectual. It, it's a different thing, but it, it is a creative venture. So yeah, like be in touch with different aspects of yourself yeah. is, is something that I think is practical. And another thing I forgot to say earlier, going back to creatives, I think part of it is that like some of us are dealing with things, something as simple as recurring depression or something like that. And so one of the things I wanted to point out is hygiene in the sense that it's like maybe skincare, face masks, doing your hair, hair masks and whatnot. Some of those things that like, yeah, there's the primary activities that we have, right? Like brushing right. your teeth daily and, and washing yourself and whatnot. But then there's the other things like we know you don't have to do a face mask every day. And we right. know that you don't have to do a hair mask or a protective style every right. day. So some of the things I think about is it's like, by the time I do realize like, oh, I could use some self-care 
I'll do that because I know that it comes frequently enough yeah. that I'll end up doing a face mask off as often as I need to or whatever. Right. But it's still me doing something that allows me to feel like accomplished in that regard, in a hygiene sense. And right. so I think that's also something, like I said, not ne- not specifically to creatives, but it often is very relevant to creatives. That makes a lot of sense because when you think of the rates of depression among creatives, self-care could be something that has to be intentional and has to be focused and take maybe a little bit more effort for a creative. Even though people may see the title and say, oh, this is for creatives. We're all creatives. We were created and we were, we are creatives and we were created in the image of our creator, which makes us creators. And I'm not saying that in a narcissistic sense. I'm saying it in a purely practical sense. Daily, we create something, whether it's creating a hairstyle or creating a nice dinner or creating a a mood, creating a space like this is a space. We're creatives. And so I just want people to understand that uh, you don't necessarily have to be a writer, a singer, an actress to be considered a creative or you are creative. (laughs) whether it's making hearts on your kids' sandwiches, that's creating. I like when you said most creatives are multi-talented. One of the things I didn't mention in your bio is my is my daughter also can sew. She has projects. She was doing hats. Are you still making the hats? She plays the piano. She didn't mention that. I'll mention it because I'm the bragging mom. And those are vastly different talents. So when you were saying I do... I'll do this talent for this time, or I'll do this, this skill for this. It makes so much sense. I wanted to ask you one other question too. The social meter, you have a lot of friends that are creatives. When you use that term with your friends or whatever, do you find using that term helps to gain and healthy relationships by setting respectful, healthy boundaries? Do you find that using the language of social media and letting people know where you are with that, does that seem to help you in other relationships as far as with your friends, your sister and significant other? Yes, a lot. A lot. It, it really does because I think the main thing with my friends and other people in my life is everyone is aware of, like I said previously, everyone is aware of me being a social being and being on the more extroverted side of things. Now, in more recent years, I consider myself a more introverted version of an extrovert, but nonetheless, I am still technically an extrovert. Uh, I'm very blessed to have a lot of people in my life and a lot of people that like me, they wanna be around me, wanna spend time with me and whatnot. And I think the main thing, social media or battery or whatever, one of the things that I like about that term is it's a facet of my overall communication with folks that helps me maintain relationships because one of the main things I try to try to model with people is it's like I'm going to be very honest and so I would like you to know that if I had a problem I would tell you I don't want the quality of my relationships to be based off of how well they can read my mind right because that's unfair I would rather I model communication for you so that you do it in return. And we know that it's fair to assume that we're good unless one of us says that we're not. And so going back to taking things personally, I feel like social media is one of those things where without that term, it's very easy to feel like you're just you're just blowing me off. Like you're just coming up with an excuse or whatever. And you just don't want to talk to me. And you're mad at me. No, if I was mad at you, I would let you know. I, and I would let right. you know in, in, in great detail exactly what you did. That would make me or not take me a minute to collect my thoughts and tell you, but I will tell you. Right. And so I find that to be very helpful with my friends because like there's a very clear difference between like, we know that it because of that communication and just very, very stark honesty it allows us to, it allows us to assume the best intentions with yeah. everything that are saying like we know that even when we're in situations where it's time to critique our friend like I wasn't I really really wasn't feeling how you said this I wasn't I wasn't appreciative of when you did that or whatnot and we're able to 
hear those with open ears and open minds, knowing that they are saying what they're meaning right now. And they're not trying to cancel me, essentially, for back of letter. But they're telling me this because they do genuinely care about the friendship. And these are ways in which they want it to improve. Right, right. So, yeah, I find it to be very beneficial. Yeah. And thank you for that explanation, because that was one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the channel and explain how helpful, one, being aware of what a social media is, what it does, and how beneficial it can be in promoting social self-care or relational care um, and maintaining those relationships. Because as we know, social self-care has to do with our connectedness with other people. You know, we're as humans, we're social beings and those connections, they can be healthy or they can be unhealthy. And it takes a uh, effort to, to maintain healthy connectedness and relationships with people, painting them, making sure that they are nurtured. And part of that maintenance and nurturing mm -hmm. is communication and articulating how this is and how I feel. And some people have used love languages to kind of communicate. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the pros and the cons about that. But the, the thing that it has in common is one thing you said that I really, really found to be so true is you can't expect somebody to read your mind and understand how you're feeling. And a lot of times we do that. Even at my age, we do that. We expect people to know and understand what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. That's not fair to put that burden on somebody to expect to know how you're feeling. It's our responsibility to articulate and communicate how we're feeling and in, in a respectful, healthy way. And hopefully that person receives it as, yes. as something that we're doing from the heart with good intentions. And we're doing it because I love you and I want to keep our relationship. And so I'm taking this chance to tell you how I feel, to tell you that this was going on. I know we're getting off a of social meter, but all of that has to do with being self-aware and being courageous enough and respectful enough of a relationship or connection that you have that you want to keep it and you do the work. And sometimes doing the work means pulling away to work on yourself or to recharge. Exactly. Especially because one of the things I think it helps to promote the relationships is because it's, if I'm in my, if I'm socially drained, I know that I'm not going to be good company right now. Right. And I don't want you to be on the receiving end of it. We're not going to be perfect. All of our hangouts aren't going to be perfect, but I want them to be as positive of an experience as they possibly can be. Right. So if I know I don't have the capacity to be a listening ear or be, you know, be a, a shoulder to cry on or, or if I can't show up for you in the way that you and I both want me to, then it doesn't benefit anyone for me to try to force it. That's true. Especially because that is where resentment builds up from in any relationship. But that's where a lot of people talk about it in marriages, which is a whole other side note. Yeah. Uh, like I want our relationship to last as long as it can. And so that is thinking about it from that standpoint. I'm like, there's no rush for me to try to force all of these hangouts in because I want you around and, so, and I'm going to keep you around. So I'll see you next week. Yeah. I'll see yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And your point just reemphasizes something that I talk about on the channel as it relates to self-care. You cannot give from an empty cistern. You mm -hmm. can't do it. So in that self-care is not selfish. It's self-preservation. And if I am taking care of myself, I'm able to show up differently for you and others. So it is very, very important and good stuff. And I'm so proud of you. And I thank you so much for taking time, coming on the channel and your support. Is there anything else that you wanted to to the conversation before we end today's interview? It was a pleasure. And I'm proud of you too. I really admire you just 
just starting, just head first into the content creation because I'm still trying to get on my grind with that as well. I'll see y'all soon. But uh, I, I just really admire how much time you've put into this, especially because like, I'm, I'm happy to see you doing something for yourself in lieu of your retirement, in lieu of your empty nesting and whatnot. I'm very happy to see you thriving and helping other people do the same. So I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And so today, you all, this was a bonus having my youngest daughter on the channel. So if you have enjoyed today's conversation with my youngest daughter, give this video a thumbs up. It really helps the YouTube algorithm know that you really like the content that I am creating. And if you want more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel. We'd love to have you as a part of the community. Remember that to hit that notification bell so that you're notified when I upload new content. I try to upload new videos once or twice a week. Thank you so much for watching the channel. Please comment. I read all the comments and I do respond. So thank you, Ify, for being on the channel. I love you so much. Mwah. Mwah.